together as we lift up a shout of praise unto God this morning. You guys are welcome to take your seats. Are you glad to be in church this morning? Are you sure? Great. For those who's watching online this morning, we are sorry. You guys are missing out. It's just wonderful. The blessing to get together as a church and worship together. There's just something spectacular about that. If you are here for the first time this morning, good morning. Um, we ask a 12% tithing in our church. Just mentioning that for the, what that's worth. We are speaking about anyway, number two, when life gives your lemons and your aunt says, tequila. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I don't have new jokes. Okay, so let's just jump in 1 Peter 1 verse 3 up until verse 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through the faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Verse 9. Obtaining the outcome of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Father, as the song said this morning, we declare that we are not enough unless your presence rests upon us, Father. So in this moment, we invite you to come and rest upon us, Father. We invite you to be welcome amongst us, Father. We have gathered to meet with you. So this morning, I bow down lowly before your throne, Father. And I humbly request that you would anoint my lips once more this morning, Father, because of your goodness, because of your grace, not because of who I am. Your word always carries power and authority, Father. And this morning, Baruch Church, we submit our hearts to your word, Father. We submit our minds unto your word, Father. We submit our feelings unto you, Father. This morning, we are here for one purpose. And that is to meet with you. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says, Amen and Amen. So we're going to talk about anyway when life gives you lemons. But I want to... Um, sorry, there's something... As you guys know, we're in the month of November. So this new series that I'm talking about, it's a little bit of a combination i had the privilege of having all my dad's old sermons um and there's a lot ladies and gentlemen the the files are long and the one drive is full okay so there was a lot of stuff that we need to i was having the privilege of working through i love checking the behind the scene notes of pastors because you experience them one way but when i look at the planning i realized that my dad was called because the notes behind the scene <laughs> I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. So in this new Anyway series, I've got the privilege of re-communicating some of my dad's sermons to you. And this morning is going to be exactly the same. Um, but before I jump into that, November month is the month where I get to celebrate. Uh, this is the third year that I have the privilege of leading our church. And it's been a tremendous privilege. And so I just love doing what I do. And then last week I showed you this beautiful um, framed article that my dad wrote when I was ordained as a pastor in 2011. And this morning I've got, a, I've got a second relic that's important to me, all right? This was handed to me by Auntie Isabel, all right? Auntie Tani Isabel, say, luister die langsam. Hello, Tani Isabel, ek praat van Tani. What she doesn't know is she gave this for me for planning purposes, right? She gave this to me the day I was appointed a senior pastor in our church. 
And she gave me two scripture verses that is written right in front of this. I never used this, this dark book. But I just kept this because of what she said to me. And I'm going to just, she, she gave me two, two um, scripture verses. I'm not sure if she was being called and obedient or if she was lazy and just Googled two scripture verses. Okay, But whatever reason, okay, these two scripture verses are quite close close to my heart. The first one is Philippians 4 verse 9. And the translation will differ slightly, but I'm going to read from this. Sutani Isabel, ek het nog steeds. This she wrote to me 1 November 2020. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God who is the source of peace and well-being will be with you. She gave me a second verse, Proverbs 2 verse 6, and it says, For the Lord gives, and she puts in brackets, skillful, skillful, and godly. Okay, I thought she was giving me a compliment, but, you know, skillful and godly, wisdom. And from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So this is something that's special to me. I just wanted to share this with you due to the celebration of the month of November. And so, Tan Isabel, she's watching on that camera. Let's jump in. I'm going to give you a quick recap of what we spoke about last week. And so we are jumping into this whole conversation, talking about when life gives you lemons, you drink tequila, or you handle what's happening with you. Okay, don't quote me on that one. So otherwise I'm going to get into trouble. Go to the next one quickly for me. We spoke about last week. Life chooses what we go through, but we choose how we go through it. All right. Life chooses what we go through. We don't always have the um, control over that, um, but we choose how we respond. And we spoke a little bit about Joseph going back into my dad's notes and how he was explaining the life of Joseph and we've got this thing in our life where we pursue happiness consistently we run after happiness we, we long for happiness and so many times people come to church because they think they will find happiness inside the church well your quietness kind of proves that to me okay so so yeah yeah it's like well what is church for it's for tithing okay that's why you come to church okay so we run out there and you think you come to church and you find happiness and then you are disappointed because you come to a place where you find problems you know why you're disappointed when you come to church? Because when you come to church, you find people. The same people that you work with, the same people in your family. It's real. Church is real. You are real. We have emotions and feelings. I'm, I'm going digressing. A little we are, we're digressing horribly. <laughs> digressing horribly. But I need you to understand that it's not about pursuing happiness. Okay. And on the contrary, I've got worse news. When, when we look at Joseph's reward, how he was rewarded, it only fixed things at the end of the story for a short while. But most of his life was difficult. It was a challenge for a long season. And so he was rewarded with hatred. And we went through his whole story. I'm not going to go through that. But I want you to pick up on something. For Joseph, it was never about happiness, but it was always about his integrity. And so the idea is that when life gives you lemons, you need to put the tequila away. And you need to make sure that you stand in integrity in any case. And then I concluded last week with this whole idea, taking wise words from my dad that he added into his notes. And he, he concluded this, this whole message that we spoke about. When, when life gets difficult, when life gets difficult, what do you do? Well, my dad's answer is very simple. He says, I want everyone to know that I was a happy man because God was with me. Hello, Johan. Welcome so by us for Ochendor. Because God was with me. It wasn't about my life went smoothly. It wasn't about that, that everything was sorted out. It was he wants the end of his story to display that he had a fulfilling life. He had a good life. He had a happy life. Why? Because God was part of his story. And so today, we're going to jump on and carry on with this idea. Anyway, number two. When life gives you lemons. The sermon I'm going to take you to is all the way back in 11 November 2004. I know, and for me, this is a long time ago. For some of you, you still have bologna in the fridge that comes from this date, okay? It just means, yes, oat, okay? You are old, okay? 2004 is, is very close to 20, 20 years ago. Um, 19 years ago. Yes, my maths is fantastic. So it, it's, it's been some long time ago, but... I'm not going to give my dad all the credit, okay? I just need to take some for myself. I mean, so I just want to mention that the first part of the sermon, I just, just out of um, um, credibility for this whole conversation that I'm having, the first part, I'm sharing something from my heart, and the last part, you will immediately hear. You will immediately hear 
when Pastor Yuan jumps into the sermon, okay? So I'm not, I'm not even going to tell you when, when I stop and he starts. You're going to pick this up immediately, okay? So just, <laughs> oh, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing. Let's start with, with 1 Peter 1 verse 3. And it starts off with this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to pause there quickly. And I want you to pick up on the terminology God and Father in one sentence. Not as normal. Okay, if you've been in our church for a while, you will know this idea a long time already. The concept of calling God Father is not a small concept. It's kind of large. Okay, and the author, as he's writing this, he says, Blessed be the God and Father. And immediately he opens up, and even though he's speaking in the reference to Jesus at this moment, because the, when you look at the other scripture verses, there's this idea that we are part of God's family, and what Jesus can do, it gives us the permission to do the same. In other words, when Jesus comes and he teaches us how to pray, he says, you can call God your Father. But that was a terminology limited to a special relationship. So when you look at what, what is referred to as a son of God, it's something called Israel, for example. Or Jesus, a very close-knitted relationship. But suddenly, we notice that in the New Testament, somewhere along the line, Jesus was so profound in his words and in his actions that we realize that now we can have a personal relationship with God, which we know, but we take for granted. You see, it's, 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 it's simple to know this, but sometimes we, we get spoiled with the faith that we've got. We get spoiled with the convenience that we have, that we take something for granted. We take something as a given that is actually a gift in our lives. Some of you treat God just like God. In other words, can I explain that to you? You treat God like someone that's up there and you are somewhere down here. Okay? So you do your thing, he does his thing, and every now and then at a funeral or wedding you can make a turn and you say hi, okay? Or when you want to pray that the Springboks win the World Cup. So whatever you guys did, it worked, by the way. And so whatever you do, it, that's our connection with God. Because God is there, but God is here. But the moment you authorize it, God is my Father, it becomes tangible. It becomes personal. And then we realize that if God is my Father, there's a very closeness and accountability level. But you guys know these things, okay? You guys are smart, right? You guys read Bible. Right? Yeah, yeah, you guys pray, right? Yeah, yeah of course, of course. I, I'm just asking this just to wake you guys up, not to test you. <sighs> he carries on to say the following. According to his great mercy. You see, you get stuff that is okay in life. Then you get stuff that is good in life. Okay. And you want to know what I want to say next? Then there are things that are spectacular. There are things that the excellence level is just so phenomenal. It's, it stands out of the crowd. It's something that you can relate to. It's something you can pinpoint because you know the quality. You know the quality. It is not good. It is great. It's phenomenal. And the author writes this to talk about the great mercy of God. I want you to realize that God's mercy in your life is no small task. You have been getting things that you do not deserve. You have been blessed with grace in your life that you do not deserve because you are fantastic. No, because God is great in His mercy. He's great in His grace. And there are many blessings in our lives that we can enjoy. There are many blessings that we enjoy in our life because of the great mercies of our God. But for some reason, we choose to look at the things we don't have. We choose to look at the things that we don't get. But we miss the great mercies of our God. And I want you to realize this morning that God has been good to you. God has been gracious to you. You didn't always get what you wanted. You didn't always get what you asked for. And you sometimes went your own way because God is God there and you are here on earth. But I need you to realize even when you turned your back against God, His mercies were expressed. Extravagant in your life. That's the best word that popped up now. Okay. Now, the great mercies, it goes even for, and, and if you guys are confused, how does this end up with tequila? Because I know that's the only thing you remember what I said with my sermon. But how does this, uh, th this link up with bad things? I, this is the essence of bad things, ladies and gentlemen. Because we experience bad things, but God's grace is good. 
and his mercy is great. How does this link up? So this is all linked with each other. Now, let's, let's get on to the next part of this verse. And it says, he has caused us to be born again. His mercy is so great that we get a second chance. His mercy is so great that you walked away when you shouldn't have walked away. But when you turned around and came back to him, he accepted you with open arms. He is so great that you get an opportunity to be born again. It's no small task. It's no small assignment. It's no small forgiveness, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes I can't forgive my wife for taking the last rollo in the packet, okay? But God forgives me when I hurt people, when I'm arrogant in my words, when I'm disrespectful, when I turn my back, when I don't seek his face, when I do something out of my own accord, when I put him aside because I'm busy with my own thing. Out of all those things, God's mercy is so great that we have the blessing and the opportunity to return to him even when we aren't worth it. And then something weird happens. The Bible teaches us, but that's where we are wrong. We are worth it. And for anyone that's got an honest opinion about yourself, it doesn't make sense. Well, how can I be worth it? How can I be worth the effort? How can I be worth the love? Because I walked away. But the author makes it clear that God's mercy is great, so great that we have opportunity to be born again, to change, to get a new start in life. And then the author, and the, this is just the first verse, okay? We've got seven, eight others, okay? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. I, I want you to understand that word living is put in there intentionally. Many people have false hope. Like, like New, Zealand, New Zealand in the World Cup, okay? Some people will have false hope in their lives, okay? Because everyone can hope. Everyone can hope. I can hope to win the lottery, okay? I can hope to achieve something. But I want you to understand that the author is making it very clear that within our circumstances, within what we are facing, our hope is not a fantasy hope. But it specifically points to a living hope. And how can they say this? Because they saw something with their eyes, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a hope where they hold their thumb fast and they do all burarat and stuff to hope things will turn out. They physically saw the resurrected Jesus standing in front of them. And now they can claim, say, I don't care what you believe, but listen to me, I was there. What we hope in is a living hope. I've seen it with my eyes. I saw the resurrection of Jesus. We are writing about this. This is not a fairy tale. This is a living hope in our lives. It's something tangible that we can hold on to. The author writes about this whole idea because it's building up to something. And he carries on to the next one. And by the way, I think if, if it was Peter that wrote this letter, I think he's, he's very smart because he's giving all the good stuff before we get to the bad stuff, okay? So he's very intentional with his words, okay? So it's interesting that he's talking about all these nice things because I hope you picked up as we read the scripture verse, he's talking about the trials and we are being grieved with trials. So he's, it's not like there's, there's, there's good things always happening. He's talking about the good, thing, thing, good things. He's talking about the good things building up. Some of the Afrikaans guys didn't see the difference there. And so, <laughs> let me just keep on preaching. Okay. okay. It's building up to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfailed, unfading. And that's fantastic. And then, like, what is it? What is it? And then it's like, in heaven. And it's like, oh, man. Okay, I thought it's going to be something undefiled. Yeah, it's going to be safe. Yeah, it's something I can feel. No, but Peter's sneaky. He builds you up. He says, this is beautiful inheritance. Nobody can take it away. And then it's like, what is it? What is it? Nobody's up in heaven. And then it's like, but what's the point? Now, let me explain this to you, okay? There are some things that's valuable in life that you cannot measure in materialistic things. And if you think I'm talking about going to heaven, that's not what I'm even, I'm not even touching on that. I'm talking about there are actions in this life that become so valuable in your life. It becomes memories. It, it becomes something that is an inheritance for you. Okay, let me explain it to you this way. When someone goes through a difficult time, let's say financially, and a family shows up and contributes to them needing food, okay? Let's say it costs you, I'm taking an example, 
It costs you out of your pocket a thousand rand to buy someone else something and you provide them food and you take care of them. Let me tell you something. That's the best thousand rand you have spent ever in your life. That shoes you bought, it's thrown away already. Okay. That new lawnmower, someone borrowed it and there's a nick on the blade already. That new haircut that you bought, it's, it's done, your hair grows again. Okay. That diet, well, it was a lie. Okay, I'm just... <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that when, when we follow God, when we have this idea of this living hope, there are areas that we are called to invest in that is treasures in heaven. In other words, it cannot, be, it cannot perish. Why? Because it's not material things. It's not here. It's not tangible things. It's not something that you invest in a hold in a, in, a, in a safe. It's something that you invest in people's spirits, ladies and gentlemen. And that becomes the most valuable things in your life. But some of you are so poor, you only have a new car to show. Some of us are so poor, the only thing you have to show is a big house. Some of us is so poor, the only thing that we can show in our lives is materialistic. And then Peter comes in and says that this inheritance that God promised us, we, we are getting trained and built and guided into something that's got heavenly value. It's got eternal value. It's not a car or a coin or shoes. But the moment you begin to invest into others, it cannot perish. You cannot lose the work that you did. You cannot, someone can't steal that because you imparted something on behalf of God in someone else's life. And nobody can steal that. Nobody can take that away. Sometimes we focus on materialistic things. And, and later on in this passage, I'm not sure if you picked up on this, um, there's a reference between faith and gold. Later, okay, maybe I read it a little bit fast. We're going to get to that section. I don't want to rush myself in. But I want you to understand there are valuable things that cannot be measured in money and cars. You cannot evaluate your relationship with your children based on what you buy for them. One Peter, one verse five. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Man, when I read that out of this whole passage, this part hit me the toughest. Because I realized people, people come speak to me and they, they make this statement. Okay, and this is, this is external. This is not how I feel on the inside. This is how they see me on the outside. They say, you are so strong. And I know in my inside I don't feel strong. I, I look at my mom and I, 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 I think she's phenomenal in strength, but I know she doesn't feel strong. I, I know, I know that's, how, uh, that's how she doesn't feel. I, I look strong. I look stable on the outside, but on the inside I feel just like me. I just feel like... And then when I read this verse, it just hit me out of the blue. Why do you have the ability to stand in seasons when other people fail around you? Why do you have the ability to stand strong when other people are falling over? Do you want to know the one single answer? Because you are guarded by your faith. It's your faith that has been protecting you. It's your faith that has been guarding you. It's your faith that has caused stability in your life. You see, this is what makes you different compared to anyone else around you. Because when you walk in the same situation as your family walk in, how come you get to stand and they tend to fall down? Because there's something that's protecting you in your life. It's your faith that has been guarding you. It's not your strength. It's not your ability, but there's divine faith in your life. And because of this faith, there's this form of protection. And now you look stronger than you actually are. You are more stable. You are wiser than you actually are. You are more committed than what the inside is. You, 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 can I use the word, you over exceed your flesh. Why? Because your faith has been protecting you in many things in your life. And you can't pinpoint this, okay? I know you can't pinpoint this. I can't pinpoint. I didn't know what it was. I was, I was unsure. But there was just a sense of peace. There was just a sense of stability. There was just a sense of faith. Uh, just a sense of focus. And immediately it pops up, it's because of my faith. It's because of your faith. People look at you and your family and they don't know. They think it's money. 
They think you've got a little extra bank account that, that you aren't talking about. They think it's a new medication that you are. They, some people even think it's the supplements and the diet because they want to ask, how do you do that? What vitamins do you drink? Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you now that you are where you are today for one simple reason. It's your faith that you don't even know about that has been carrying you through. And as young people, for example, you are more stable than your parents. You are more stable than your aunts and your uncles. Why? Because they live a godless life. But because you have decided to follow God, because you have decided to pursue Him, there is a protection and it's guarding your life. Faith has the opportunity to protect. And if you think I'm talking about materialistic things, I mean, you just don't know me at all. Your faith is guarding you. You are strong because of your faith. You are called because of your faith. Your life is going to turn out differently because of your faith. It's not skill. It's not ability. It's not personality. It's not materials. But because you have committed your heart to God, there is a sense of spiritual strength that even you can't understand. If you're feeling a little bit weak this morning, test your faith. If you're feeling a little bit shallow this morning, test your faith. If you, if you wonder why are they making it, and I'm not talking about money, why are they making it and I'm not making it, I want to ask you to test your faith this morning. It just might happen be that the person that's stable is because their heart is protected. Okay, I'm getting a little bit heavy now. Let's, I'm, I'm going to get back to this if we've got time at the end. 1 Peter 1 verse 6. And in this you rejoice through now, though now through, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter is very smart. He gives a couple of verses and now he jumps in with the real world, okay? He says all these beautiful things, your faith protects you and your heart is strong and all this fantastic thing. But you need to be aware that you can be grieved even with grace. You can be grieved even with grace. Life can happen even with grace. Bad things can happen even with grace. Circumstances can go haywire even with grace. Financial issues can happen even with grace. Health issues can happen even with grace. Just because you are grieved, it doesn't mean grace is lacking, ladies and gentlemen. We must stop trying to manipulate God by using Bible scripture verses to benefit us. Life is life. This is no magic that's taking place over here. There's no voodoo that's taking place here. It's normal people that's deciding to follow God in season and out of season. And out of season is going to happen. If, if there's one thing that I want you to pick up in the Old Testament, you know what the difficult part for the authors of the Bible were? Is to explain how good God is and how great God is, yet Israel is conquered. How, how on earth, how on earth do you reconcile that Yahweh is most powerful, most creator being that there is amongst all the nations, yet Israel and Jerusalem gets defeated and gets overthrown. And the authors sit and they struggle with this and then they realize it's not God that's missing. It's us that has been missing from him. It's not that God is not powerful. It's not God is there. We have removed the protection from us because we decided not to follow him anymore. And God, I don't want to say God pulled away. We kind of left him like the prodigal son. We left him at home and we walked away. You can be grieved even with grace in your life. And the grievance is not a reflection of the lack of grace at all. 1 Peter 1 verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of anything that's genuine needs to be tested, ladies and gentlemen. That's why you get a certificate when you purchase certain things that's important. That's why you get something valuated. Because if it's valuable, the genuineness needs to be tested, ladies and gentlemen. When we get tested and when trials happen, it's not the concept of us being always bad. It's not the concept of us doing things wrong. It's because our faith needs to be tested. And I know we don't like this topic in church. 
Why would God test me? Why? Well, God doesn't test you. Life happens, and then you choose who you're going to follow. Life is going to give you enough opportunities to be tested, God not even having to do anything, okay? Relationships is going to do enough for you to test you. Your workplace is going to do enough for you to test you. SARS is going to do enough for you to test you, okay? There's enough tests in this world. that has got nothing to do with God. But the question is that if you want to know, I mean, I've, I've, I've said this before. I've said this before, and I'm going to quickly say this. Um, Bishop T.D. Jakes, he said this once. He said, he knelt one day before the pulpit. He was, when he was younger, he prayed, and he was too shy to kneel down because he had holes under his shoes, okay? He was too shy. And then he said this. Today, he's confident in his wealth, and he doesn't apologize to anyone because he knows he served God when he had nothing. And now that he's got everything, he's still serving God. And he says that testing period was the most influential time on in his life because today he stands with confidence knowing that he's not serving the blessings of God. He is serving God. It just worked out that the blessings followed. And so your trials and the testing periods in your life is there to make sure that what you have on the inside is genuine and this becomes valuable. Because you have proven to yourself, you have proven to yourself that you are faithful not because of what you get, but you are faithful because of who God is and you serve Him irrespective of the circumstances. That is more valuable than gold in our lives. But that's not usually our stories. Move on. Let me carry on. My time is running out. 1 Peter 1 verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Just, just phenomenal terminology. Going through this beautiful blessing spot that we just explained. He jumps over to this idea. And a short verse. Trials is going to come. Trials is going to come. Okay. And then he, he jumps to a next spot. and says, but how do we stay faithful in this? How do we persevere? How do we do things anyway? Okay. Without tequila. <laughs> how do we move forward? And he says something significant. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. I, I want you to pick up on this. The work that God did in your life is so magnificent that you have the ability to love someone you haven't even seen yet. Some people need a physical manifestation of God. We see it in church. They run after miracles. They run after stories. And many times it's, uh, we've come across so many of these miracles that are even fake. It's, it's, it's fabricated to build up hype. It's fabricated. Some people use doom. Some people use coffins. But they do anything to counterfeit the work of what God is really doing. And now, Peter is writing and he says, just pause and think that there are these inheritance things Difficult, happen, difficult times happen, but, but yet you guys are committed. Yet you guys are pushing through. And then he pauses and he thinks, just think that I've seen him, but you guys haven't. That his work, his sacrifice was so large that it builds love and you haven't seen him face to face yet. What magnificence is this? What overwhelming work, what overwhelming grace, what overwhelming love that so many thousands of years later, we have not seen Jesus with our eyes, but yet we experience His work in our lives every single day. That is who we follow. That is who we serve. Verse 9. And then it comes to the end of this part and it says, Obtaining the outcome of your faith. I need you to be aware that there's an outcome of your faith. I need you to be aware there's an end story of your faith, okay? Just because you are struggling now, it doesn't mean that this is the end part. No, no, no. There's a trial part and then there's a conclusion of the trial. There is a season and there's a, a conclusion of the season. This faith is not an empty faith. This trials that we go through is not empty. There is a fulfillment of a season in your life. The question is, can you be faithful inside the season? It's not forever. It's a time. It's a season. It's an allocation. It's a trial. It's a testing. But when you walk through this, only you can determine what the end of the story will look like. But I can assure you this. There is an outcome of your faith. There's an end result of your faith. What that looks like is going to happen to you. Now, I'm going to jump over and just want to conclude this message. I want you to realize that bad things happen. Bad things happen. Or happens. I'm not sure about the tense there, okay. But what we need to focus on is our reactions towards our circumstances. Because our actions is a reflection 
of what's on the inside. Our actions in our circumstances is a reflection of what's on the inside. I'm telling you now, if you're honestly serving God in the bad times, you're going to be strong enough to serve Him in the good times. I, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. If you're strong enough to serve God in the bad times, you're going to be strong enough to serve Him in the good times. When there's more opportunity for distraction. When there's more occasions for f- losing focus. When there's an elevation taking place in your life. When there's a new season. When there's leadership that's happening. When promotion takes place. Because you served Him here, your character is strong enough to serve Him here as well. I'm going to conclude with this. And we're going to talk for the last two minutes about the difference between can't versus won't. You see, when we talk about I can't do something, it's a God-given limitation. Okay? I can't run fast. Well, unless I'm scared. Okay? I can't fly. And I don't want to fly in the airplanes that they have there, okay? I, I, I can't fly. It's God-given limitations. But many things in our life is not that we can't do it, it's that we won't do it. It's not that we can't serve God, we just don't want to serve God. It's not that I can't pray, I don't want to pray. It's not that I can't be generous, I don't want to be generous. And sometimes we link these two so closely together that when we go through difficult times, we put a sticker of can't over what we are facing, but actually you must put the real sticker that says won't, okay? It's nothing to do with the circumstances. It's your response towards the circumstances. It's not that God is limiting you in this response. It's that you won't respond the way you are supposed to respond. So, when, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing. when you don't, <laughs> when you go through difficult things in your life, do you fast or do you drink? Now, we do get thirsty at times, ladies and gentlemen. We do get thirsty. But the question is, how do you respond? Some people, when they face difficult things, they will drink. And some people, the spiritual people in my life, you know what the first thing they do when difficult things happen? They tell me, we are going to fast for the next three days. And then I complain. Because why do you need to, Patrick, why do you tell me something that God told you? Why must I fast if God's paid? He didn't tell me to fast, okay? He told (laughs) do you fast or do you drink when difficult things happen listen carefully to what the question says do you choose life or do you tend to choose death do you know that you choose death sometimes in your life do you know this you choose deliberately to give up do you know this but when we face difficult times it's not always can't it's just I won't it's Choosing death is sometimes easier in our life. Giving up is sometimes easier in your life. But my question today is, when difficult things happen, do you choose life or do you choose death? Because in many circumstances, you make the choice. When difficult things happen, do you love or do you hate? I know what comes naturally for us. But you know what God requires of us? Is to choose love. And sometimes it's the most difficult choices we need to make. Because hate comes naturally. Almost if drinking comes naturally for some people. But we, we, we tend to lean towards these negative implications. But when we follow God in difficult seasons, it's not about can't, it's about won't. We need to choose the other side. And this one is, is, is best said in Afrikaans. Okay, best said in Afrikaans. Ho oh, jy eight of ho oh, jy op. Now, I know if you, if, you, if you don't speak Afrikaans, I'll translate this for you. Like you out or like you finish. It kind of sounds the same in Afrikaans. You know, the, the, the real translation is, and I want to share this with you. When You can go to the next one for me. When illness comes in your life, do you hold on? Or do you give up? Because bad things is going to happen. You're going to be discouraged. You're going you're to be focused on, on focusing on the negative things in your life. But if there's one thing that I want, to, I want you to take away, and again, yeah, out, of, out of honor of my dad, as he was um, sharing his journey and going through things, that bad things is going to happen, but in the end, we always have a choice how we respond in that season. 
And we all can give up. But I want to tell you this morning, give it one more go. I want to tell you, anyways, hold on anyway. You, maybe you've got a little bit of lemons and maybe a little bit of tequila on the side. As well. I would just call it communion wine. But any case, it's just very clear communion wine. So um, what I'm trying to say is that I, I, want to, I want to speak into your heart this morning. That it's been tough, but hold on just a little bit more. Hold on. Don't give up yet. I know you are tired. But don't give up yet. God has given you a vision. God has given you direction. God has given you a hope. God has given you a church. Hold on just a little bit longer. Because as you are faithful within this trial, you will realize that your faith was genuine all along. You had a genuine faith in God. You had a genuine relationship with Him. Because it was revealed within your trial. I'm going to conclude with a statement. It's your faith not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of His victory. It's your faith that will cause victory. It's your faith that will become valuable. It's your faith that will be your trophy. But then you must know it's going to be tested. It's going to be tweaked. It's going to be cropped on. It's going to be looked at. But if you can serve faithfully within the season, you're going to come out the other side. And a lot of people can say, we know about Jesus. We read about Jesus. But when we persevere in difficult seasons, we can stand with a proud heart and say, we really follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. What a privilege to be able to just spend some time in your word, Father. Thank you for being good to us. Father, I do not know who is experiencing difficult times, Father. But in this moment, we pray that your spirit would empower them, Father. That your spirit would strengthen them, Father. Maybe there's some people here that has started to give up already, Father. But we want to speak and pray over them. It's not the time to give up yet, Father. We are holding on. We are pushing through. We are moving forward because we know that this trial is just going to display our genuineness, Father. This difficult season is just going to be the display our genuine faith that we have in our hearts, Father. And at the end of of this journey our lives will be will bring glory and honor to you and we can say that we have genuinely loved you we have genuinely followed you father may you forgive us for the times we turned away from you may you forgive us for the times that we blamed you father our hearts are sore our hearts are broken but we in this morning surrender our hearts to you father may we be found as good and faithful servants in your kingdom. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.